Hi there, I'm Malcolm Graham Wood and today I'm on Core Finance doing my CEO interview. I'm delighted to say that uh, today's guest is Andrew Knott, CEO of Savannah Energy. Welcome back, Andrew. Thank you, Malky. Good day to you. Great to see you. Um, as I always do, I think it's a, a good idea if, if you could, uh, particularly as we're moving, moving ahead so quickly, if you could just give me uh, an up-to-date overview of Savannah, Savannah Energy as it looks at the moment. Yeah, okay. So Savannah Energy is a name listed oil and gas company. We have operations in two countries, Niger and Nigeria. We're involved in projects which are important for both of the countries in which we operate. The Nigerian project supplies over 10% of the gas required for the country's electricity generation. And in um, Niger, uh, we're part of a wider project which in aggregate is expected to increase GDP by at least 24% over the course of the coming years. So both of those projects are quite big. From a scale and size perspective, our guidance this year is uh, to deliver total revenues of more than $200 million. And our midpoint of range cost guidance is $70 million. I think what's important to say about the revenue line is the longevity of that revenue line and the credit risk profile against it. So the weighted average contract life that we sell our gas for that generates that revenue is 15 years. Uh, 90, over 90% sorry, of that revenue is derived from fixed price gas contracts, so no oil price linkage and uh, a significant portion of them have inflation linkage with it, within them. And of those gas contracts, 97% uh, by value um, are against AA or AAA equivalent credits uh, through credit enhancement projects with bank guarantees. So. We really have a very strong and stable and what we believe to be strong, stable and recurring uh, revenue stream um, with a well understood cost base. Uh, and then with the Niger project, we have the capital growth through the exploration and development of that asset. But even within the Nigerian uh, asset, which we can talk about in more detail, there's a lot of growth that we expect to come through through additional gas sales agreements. Great stuff. Um, I was going to ask you to drill down a bit into the uh, half one figures which you've uh, you've just put out. Uh, to a certain extent, you've you've done that already, um, giving us the the reiterated guidance you had on um, on revenue and costs. Um, mm -hmm. And as you said, you did uh, a cash collection of over one hundred and thirty million dollars uh, to the end of August, which is, um, if anything was needed, any proof was needed, that was it. Um, I wanted to go through a bit more detail of the life of the gas contracts, although you've done it in, in some detail already. Um, you, you say that it's uh, you've got 15 years of contract. Also, um, are these gas these contracts negotiated? Uh, how's the how's the long term price negotiated on the contracts, uh, Andrew? Okay, so uh, we have three principal customers today: two power stations. Um, and the Unisem Cement Factory, which is a subsidiary of Lafarge. So in two of those contracts, we have um, inflation linkage. One of them is fixed price through life of contract. That's the highest price contract is fixed price through life of contract. Um, so about 70% of our revenues have inflation linkage with the balance uh, being fixed price through life of contract. The, um, the new contract that we announced at the beginning of the year, which is not on stream yet, the FIPL of FAM contract, which is with another power station, that's more short term in nature. Um, but as we as, as that contract rolls forward, you would expect to see infl inflation link linkage with that contract. And going forward, you would expect that um, the new contracts that we're signing, especially those with industrial customers, will be higher than our weighted average portfolio price. That we receive today, but also with uh, inflation protection. Yeah, I'm, uh, I've got a question about those, but I might as well bring it in, uh, bring it forward a bit now, because you've always said that you're looking to bring on additional uh, industrial customers and power station customers, uh, and I've seen uh, companies across Africa doing just this. Uh, is, is there a significant difference in what you charge a power station compared to an ind industrial customer, or? Or they are very much the same. No, so there is there, there is a very uh, there's, there's quite a significant difference between a power station customer, industrial customer, and what the the gas price would be. <coughs> so the difference typically between a power station customer is they take a big base load 
of gas, yeah. so much larger volume, um, and they typically take a much lower price. So, for example, our weighted average price realization in 2020 will be about three dollars ninety. But we, when we go to an industrial customer, typically they're paying twelve bucks in MCF equivalent for diesel power. Yeah. So when the discussion that we have with industrial customers is if you move to a gas solution, it should pay back within six to 12 months. And thereafter, you, you will have a significant saving on your on, on your cost of power. Um, and that is um, cost of power generation, sorry. And that is uh, so so the for example, the, the industrial gas price in the West of the country is pretty well established at $7.50 plus. An MCF, but what we've been saying is that when we sign industrial customers, they will be we expect them to be significantly more profitable than than selling to a power station. I, th I thought so that might be the case, and, uh, and also, um, you know, you're trying to persuade these guys to go away from diesel. Apart from the fact that you're going to end up over the over the longer period cheaper for for them, is, is there a government incentive? Are there any government plans in Nigeria to, to make them or encourage them to do such thing? Well, I think the two main motivating factors to choose gas over diesel is in, in the Nigerian context is firstly price and second, security of supply. In Nigeria, uh, diesel is a, is, a, is a net imported product uh, because there's a shortage of uh, effective refining capacity in country, which can mean at times that people who rely on diesel generation, apart from the fact it's energy inefficient and price inefficient, the the they, they, they have intermittent supply of, of 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 fuel if you're running an industrial process and you do not have a regular supply of, of fuel clearly that's a major problem it creates all sorts of issues with how you then conduct your industrial processes and the profits and margins associated with that so clearly we can offer something as piped gas which is much more reliable and much more cost effective so we believe that with the brand equity we have as a business, the reliability we've shown over a long period of time, even prior to our ownership when the assets were in a more stretched environment, they still managed to meet their customer nominations. But the, the key thing is we bought a company in, in the, the assets of Seven Energy, which, were, which was highly distressed. Now the company is no longer distressed in a strong, solid financial position. That enables counterparties to get the confidence to contract yeah. us. I'm confident that over the course of the next six to 12 months, you will see a lot of, uh, let's just say, movement in terms of new customers, et cetera. And certainly prior to year end, we're expecting uh, some significant news for And although it would seem obvious that you'd want to take more industrial customers and power customers, uh, they, they both have their, their, their specific advantages. Have you got an, an ideal mix as to the two, or will you just take it as and when it comes? So I think, look, the... We have very significant spare capacity in our pipeline network and our pipeline network is the only pipeline gas distribution network of its type in southeast Nigeria. So if someone wants gas and someone wants to sell gas, then by and large in that part of the country, they will have to use our pipeline network. So there's an ability to supply much, much more gas full stop, whether it's our gas or someone else's gas to customers and both our upstream operations and our processing facilities are significant spare capacity. And we have an appetite to build additional capacity over time as required. Um, but clearly, as with any business, our goal is to maximize the returns for our stakeholders and ensuring that we're operating in a socially responsible manner. So we will continue to supply to power stations, but clearly the, the, we think it's very important to help stimulate economic growth in Nigeria through additional industrial activity. And, um, the fact that the price is higher for that indicates the need for someone to supply them yeah. with, with 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 that power, which they're currently not able to get. So um, we don't have a target mix. What we want is a diversified set of customers with whose whose credit status for buying our gas we're comfortable with. And and you, as you said in the last uh, figures that you supply about ten percent of Nigerian power with your gas. And, and is there a specific limit on the upside for that, or could that could that grow much higher? Okay, well, with the FIPL contract, if that was if we were operating at, at full steam across all our customers, we'd be linked up to fifteen percent. So the when that comes on stream, that's 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 quite a significant milestone yeah. for our business. In terms of 
there's no upper. I mean, I I don't believe in limiting the in limiting your ambition, but I think it's important that you take it in real in, in realistic bite sized chunks. So we will continue to invest in and grow the business. I think the business organically has tremendous opportunities both in Nigeria and Niger. Um, there's tremendous sunk capital. I mean the the overall project in the southeast of Nigeria is like one and a half billion dollars of capital that's been sunk into that project. It's a very, very significant investment that's that, 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 that occurred to make it all happen. Yeah. So um, we we obviously, our, our job, our primary job, the opportunity we identified when we did the original acquisition is to take on this project, solve the issues around it, which we largely did when we implemented the World Bank Partial Risk Guarantee for Calabar, which moved a customer which was was not paying regularly to give it that effectively a AAA backing. Um, and 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 then grow that business and then grow that business further and that's and that's what we're doing and i think the key thing about the numbers which i i that, that we're now talking about in terms of cash generation for the business in terms of growth potential for the business is that this is us delivering on what we said we would do yeah. when we did the original yeah. acquisition and that's 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 really the key thing and if you go back from when we listed the business whether it's the cost control that we exhibited in niger or the activities that we conducted in niger we always did what we said we would do. We got there in the end, and that's yeah, the sort yeah. of core message that I would, uh, I would, um, I would reiterate. I think it's a real strong differentiator in terms of what we say we ultimately do. Um, uh, and I, there's no doubt about that. When you read the end of the your interim uh, comments and so on, it, it's clear that you're on a roll, uh, and you're talking about cash collections going up. Uh, they got, went up dramatically from the interim period to the end of August. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, all time the the record Nigerian gas production numbers. So you know those are you know that is a significant position of strength in Nigeria, which you continue to see being able to deliver, uh, if not improve upon. Yeah, look, with the new customer pipeline that we have, we're very very confident and comfort comfortable that 2021 will be an even stronger year than 2020. And then we talk 2022 will be stronger than 2021, just from the organic portfolio that we have. Clearly, the other big piece of the jigsaw that we want to find a solution for is getting Niger on stream. We've got five oil discoveries that we made ourselves from scratch. Um, there's existing infrastructure in Niger, both planned and existing, that we are seeking to, to, to link that project up to. We said we'll update the market prior to year end. Um, in terms of how we will do that and the sort of cost structure associated with that. But we're working very, at this stage, all I can say is we're working very, very hard on, on the possibilities for that. But again, that's another significant value leg for us. Um, as in when we get that, we're able to talk about what we're, what we're planning to do there openly. So the, um, and we firmed it up as well. So yeah. like there's, there's a lot of growth just sitting there in the business. It's, it's management's task to then unlock it. I, I think it, it, it's worth remembering, uh, I didn't, you don't need me to tell you that, uh, that ironically, that when people like me and your existing shelters, because I remember going back into your office years ago, and it was a Niger play. And you know, we were worried at that stage about how you get rid of the oil from Niger, from Niger pipeline or whatever it happened to be. Mm -hmm. Since then, Seven has obviously taken over and Nigeria has taken over to a certain extent. Uh, 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 but I do think that uh, particularly the the some of the existing shareholders and particularly some of the existing retail shareholders are, it, you know, have been waiting and waiting and waiting to see when Niger would, would, would happen again. I think you said in the interims it would be first oil in the, in the coming 18 months or something. I'm not going to press you because I've already said you can't say, but I, I think the, 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 the shareholders would love to know, obviously, that, you know, it's, obviously it sounds like, as you just said, it's very much at the top of your list of things to do and it will definitely be part of Savannah going forward. Well look what I would say is like we don't prioritize one of the businesses over the other. We see both as having tremendous value and tremendous potential. Um I think clearly in the current environment a lot of the focus has been on the assets which are currently generating cash as opposed to those with the significant yeah, fair enough. I think but I would say that's an external perception, not an internal perception. I would also say that one thing which I think people have to appreciate is that we're very, very proactive in terms of the management of Niger. So when we had all these problems with the pandemic and all the rest of it and what that meant to the external financing market at the time, 
we went to the government of Niger and we agreed in principle to um, to extend our PSCs effectively for another 10 years worth of exploration plus 25 years of production and then in debt and then assuming you can demonstrate the economic case yeah. you can to produce and and I think that was a very proactive thing that that we were able to do that we were able to achieve it demonstrates a good relationship with the Niger authorities and therefore um, we have the time to plan this out properly we believe but um Clearly, we want to start generating cash flow from those assets. And in terms of the infrastructure point that you mentioned, I think you've seen there's a lot of information around your report and our investor presentations around. Yeah. Um, we plan to do that, but that's that's basically linking up to an existing uh, an existing pipeline, 463 kilometers to an existing refinery at Sindar in the middle of the country, all through largely existing infrastructure. So it's 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 not complicated stuff. One thing I always say is that what we look to do is to manage above ground risk, identify opportunities associated with above ground risk or perceptions of above ground risk. We don't take significant subsurface risk in our view. Our general view as a company is that the rocks were determined millions of years ago. There's not a lot you can do about them if they're dodgy. So don't go with, <laughs> so don't go no, with I remember, I remember all, all the way from, from the fall. Oh. And, so it's, yeah. all of our projects you can you, you 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 could you could undertake using technology that was available in the 1960s yeah well it's a really important time uh, andrew as we get we're running a little bit out of time but as we run forward through the end of this year we're going to see profitability for the business you know in in quite decent style next year from what i've seen of the forecast your debt is falling uh cash flow is obviously increasing um uh, you've suggested a dividend next next year, maybe. Um, I presume that depends to a certain extent on uh, on how it how it hangs out at the interim stage next year. But um, you know, it, it does look very positive in terms of the numbers. Yeah. So look, what what we've been saying is that um, this year is about proving the numbers on paper. So demonstrating to people that we are capable of generating and delivering the numbers that we said we were capable of generating and delivering, and then next year our strong preference should be to commence some form of distribution to our uh, to our shareholders. Me, myself, personally. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean... I'm, I'm a significant shareholder and I, 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 would, I would be very happy to receive a regular stream of income from our business. But uh, the key thing is, I think we've all got to get through the current um, economic environment, get comfortable around that, make sure that uh, the business remains in the strong position we believe it's in today, and then we can look at that sort of uh, sort of shareholder distributions next year. And that's that's the sort of the, the the message that we have as a board and a management team to our stakeholders. Good stuff. Well, I'm I'm I'm, the, I'm fully aware that we're running a bit short of time. I always ask him uh, at the end to do a sort of where do you see the company in twelve to eighteen months? For yeah, for for Savannah, this is a massive. Uh, thing over the next 12 to 18 months because if we say let's say the end of next year all the things that i've mentioned you've mentioned give me so much in there you talk about a full cycle which presumably means bringing in you know the niger exploration and the upstream side of it you talk about being clean and being a gas company as opposed to being you know as opposed to the diesel players in nigeria so popular on that front uh, i imagine you've got esg people crawling all over you as well um just do me a favour and put it all together for me, Andrew. In the sort of where would you expect this company to in this this time towards the end of next year? Okay, so I guess I guess yeah. So in by the end of next year, I'd expect us to uh, have signed up additional gas customers in Nigeria and to have started to deliver gas to a significant portion of those customers. I would uh, of hope that the Niger project is moving forward that we're doing the development or delivering cash flows in that period from that project and we're replanning to go back and go and explore up that western flank of the of our um of the r3 r1 areas yeah. in, in niger um i would hope we're generating very significant cash flows at that point and i would hope that we may that we have actively reviewed and looked at other opportunities to grow the business which we may or may not have executed upon but the core focus today and we'll stay that way is on making sure that we get the most out of the assets that we 
already have, given the significant organic growth that's, that, that we have. From an ESG perspective, I think it's important to say that, um, to, to, to take on your point, our projects are extremely important for the countries that we operate in. Like from a societal perspective, the tax contribution, the economic growth contribution, they're really they're very critical for both of the countries of operation. So I think that in terms of the societal benefit, I think is very, very clear. In terms of the way we run our business, we've always run our business to the highest um, standards. The Nigerian assets have operated to very high standards because they had a primarily developmental finance institutional shareholder base prior to our acquisition of them. So for example, World Bank standards, they were already reporting to them. So if you look at our annual report, it's a very big document, 177 pages, but there's a very significant sustainability section in that, but there's also a lot about the business in terms of the key uh, political stakeholders, the countries that we operate in, the technical details around the assets, et cetera, et cetera. It's much more than just a numbers document. And I would encourage any shareholder or stakeholder in general that's interested in our business to take the time to read through it because yeah. there's a lot of work and a lot of information in that. Brilliant. Thank you so much for your time, Andrew. It's been great to see you again and uh, I look forward to catching up again soon. Thank you, um, Mark. It's an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for watching. My name is Malcolm Graham Wood. This has been my core finance CEO interview. My guest today has been Andrew Knott, CEO of Savannah Energy. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and see you again soon. Bye now.